welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Well, on today's show, we're going to talk a little about soil testing, how to do it, where to do it, and how often to sample are some of the common questions we get. We'll answer those today. When we think about uh, questions in the fall, one of the questions that I hear a lot is, when should I start harvesting my corn for maximum yield and profitability? Should I let that corn dry down in the field a little more, or should I take it now? Well, as always, we have a tough to control Weed of the Week. That's coming up later in the show, as is Iron Talk. But first, here's our Farm Basics. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about what exactly is drain tile? Well, when you look at a plastic pipe with holes in it, is this what you think about when you think about drain tile? I, I know when I was a kid, my dad said, well, that's drain tile. And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? How is that tile? Right, it's not tile. But that's where it originally came from was actual tile pieces that they put in the ground. Well, today, like Darren said, they're taking plastic pipe, just putting holes in that, and that allows water to get in and then flow out of a field. It's the same type of thing that you have right around your house, most likely. If you have a sump pump in your house, there is drain tile surrounding your house and that flows into that sump pump. So that keeps the water table down, that's it. That's the whole point of having drain tile there. It's not to remove all the water in the soil. You are never gonna be able to do that. You're just trying to keep the water table down. Well, if you look at it, when you're looking at new house construction, they're gonna put the tile in just below where the basement floor is going to be, and it's gonna control that water from coming up into the basement. It's the same thing that happens out in the field, and people a lot of times think, well, this is to deal with all that excess rain that you're getting, and it's water coming in from the top. No, it's the, it's the groundwater coming up from the bottom. So as you get plentiful rainfall, your soil is going to fill up and it's going to charge up with water. But there's only so much water that your soil can hold. And as you get past that saturation point, uh, at this point, that's where that water table is up and your tile lines are going to run. Let's put it this way. If you ever take an Agronomy 101 class, one of the first things they're going to talk to you about is ideal soil composition is roughly 50% dirt, 25% water, and 25% oxygen. The problem when the water table comes up is now you're 50% dirt and 50% water. Uh, where's the oxygen? That's right, there isn't any left. So the problem is without oxygen, your soil microbes are gonna die and your plant roots are gonna die, which leads to poor plant growth or even dead plants. And then long term, that's not good for the soil either. You can read in any farm magazine today, one of the most important things they talk about on farms is having a healthy soil. I can promise you, if you don't have good drainage and you don't have oxygen in the soil, you will not have a healthy soil. The other thing is if you've got 50% dirt, 50% water in your soil and no oxygen, well, any additional rain you get is just gonna run off across the top. That's where we see erosion and these types of problems. By installing drainage tile, farmers have been able to dramatically reduce erosion around the country. So once again, drain tile, I realize today farmers aren't putting in actual tile pieces. What they're doing though, is they are putting in plastic pipe, just like you would around your house that has holes in it to allow water to get in. And now we can keep that water table down so roots have room to grow. And as we grow those plants out in our fields, they can choke out weed competition from our Weed of the Week. We'll talk about how to control this tough weed later in the show. Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Avoid the V-shaped pattern of injury caused by chemical buildup in your booms. The Express End Cap from Hypro eliminates the dead ends that lead to herbicide buildup and provides easy access to your booms, giving a complete flush between applications. Hypro, helping you spray better. 
With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. One of the things Darren and I have talked a lot about here in recent years has been what moisture percentage do we want to start with our corn harvest? So for example, I think about in the old days we used to want that corn all the way down to 17% moisture to cut costs, cut our drying expense, but today as we talk to a lot of the high yield farmers around the United States, they're telling us, hey we're getting the best yields at 22% to 25% moisture. I realize we have a little bit of drying cost, but if we have more yield that should more than pay for it. The big thing here that you have to consider is what are you farming for? You're farming for profit, right? Well, you want to make money. You're, you've done all the work all throughout the season raising this corn crop and doing the most you can to get maximum bushels. Now you need maximum profit too. And we sacrifice a lot of profit on the farm for convenience. Maybe you're like us and you say, well, we want to haul a little bit of corn right to town at harvest time because we don't have enough bin space. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, the easy way is to let it dry down to whatever a tolerable moisture percentage is at the elevator or ethanol plant. Maybe it's 17% in your case. You say, as soon as we're down to 17, that's when I'm going to harvest for my convenience. Maybe you want to do like Brian was suggesting, harvest at 22 to 25%, dry that corn down, and then haul it to town. But we look at, well, we're going to spend money on gas to try and dry that corn down. Let's look at what the net dollars are in both cases. The reason why you may end up with more net dollars by harvesting the corn a little bit wetter, it comes down to a few things. First of all, it's harvest loss or just loss in the field prior to harvest. Last year, for example, anybody that let that corn get dry in our area, the stalks got more brittle, we, there was a lot more issue with lodging, corn plants falling over and corn ears dropping off. So certain varieties were certainly worse than others, but the point is if anybody harvested at 22%, they had almost zero loss prior to going through with the combine. If they let it get down to 17 or worse yet 15, they had a lot of loss. Now on top of that, there's going to be more that's going to fall off at the head if you let it get real dry. And then finally, if there is some of that loss, well now you have more volunteer corn the next year that you have to control. And if you don't control it timely, you lose yield in your soybeans. So you've got all these factors and I realize it's hard when you say I've got to spend some money on more drying cost. But we would just encourage you, look at the big picture and see what is going to dollar out better for you. I guess the last thing that I wanted to add real quick is I have personally been the guy who's run the grain dryer on our farm and I did it for about 20 years. Well, I learned real fast that when we started harvest early, our temperatures were warmer and it was a lot easier for me to dry the corn down. So what I'm saying is by starting harvest a little bit earlier, it actually took a little less gas even though I had to dry out an extra one, two, three points out of that corn. The other thing to think about, Brian, is just the time. On our farm, we're up against snow, and we're trying to get all that corn out and try and get whatever work we have to do in the fall out in these fields done before it starts snowing, 
many years, there's not much time there to get it done. If we're starting our harvest a little bit earlier, it actually gives you more time at the end of the season to do all those other jobs. Now you mentioned the money you're going to save not having to control volunteer corn, the money that you're going to make not losing grain out in the field. I look at the time we're going to gain in the fall for doing things like strip tillage or fertility work or drainage work too. The last thing that I've got here today is I understand that if you have to haul your corn right into an elevator, you don't have a drying setup at home, you're probably going to think about this an awful lot different than I do when we actually can dry everything on the farm and very quickly and we can, if we choose to, store everything on the farm. So when I look at the cost, it doesn't cost us a whole lot. We've got the equipment there, I've got the bins there. We're really just looking at a little bit of wear and tear on some of the equipment and how much gas is it going to take. Well, with propane costs not terribly high, I say, boy, it just costs so little for me. I'm going to start early because of all the other benefits and because I look at, hey, I'm going to gain a little bit more yield. I'm going to have less volunteer corn on a net basis. I think I'm going to come out ahead when I start my corn harvest somewhere around that 22%. I really don't want to have to start at 25. I'll take a few acres at 25, but starting at 22 for me, that's my new goal on the farm. And we definitely see this in areas around the country that are just getting going in corn. They're investing in bins, they're investing in dryers because it just gives you options to potentially make more money on your farm. Well, another thing that will always make you more money on your farm is having clean fields. You don't want to have our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop it coming up later in the show. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yields what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. Everything I've looked at that we have sprayed so far this year have had great control. The Extendamax with Vapor Grip technology is just outstanding. I haven't seen anything that we've missed so far. We are very, very excited about the control on some of our biggest weed problems. I'm completely satisfied with the Extend program. This line is probably the best in 10 years, both in soil and in the plant. Joe, you've been doing this for a while. What's your take? Well, Don, you take a player like High Energy N, three forms of nitrogen, plus sulfur and iron with slow release technology, he's making plays all season long. Oh, look at his numbers. He's getting it done. But don't forget about in response. This guy's designed for a quick release nitrogen. It's looking like another championship season for Agro Liquid. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm. Because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. I want you to think about how much money do you spend on your farm each year on fertilizer. Now my next question is, are all those dollars being spent appropriately? Do you really know? Are you spending exactly the right dollars on every individual acre on the farm? Well look, you're never going to know this unless you do a good job of soil testing. So that's what we want to talk about today. How should you do this? Where should you do this? And how often should you soil sample? 
Let's start from this beginning, Brian. What if you've never soil sampled before? What I would say is you're gonna need to grid soil sample that ground, probably on a two and a half acre grid, maybe a five acre grid at the biggest, just to get an idea of what you're starting with. If you say, well, I've got some samples where uh, my fertilizer dealer pulled one sample per field, I would throw them in the garbage. You really have no idea. Did they pick the best area of the field, the worst area of the field? Did they find an average area of the field? It's tough to know. Now, in terms of setting up zones, if you said, well, I don't know if I want a grid sample, maybe I could zone sample, you could certainly do it based on topography or off your yield data, or you could work with a company like Farmer's Edge, look at satellite data over multiple years, and overlay that with your yield data. I think that would be the best way to start if you're gonna do a zone type sampling program. But if you've never done anything, I'd strongly recommend grids. In terms of soil sampling yourself, there are really only a few keys that I would tell you. First of all, get an app like the Ag PhD Soils app and go right to the grid point or zone point. When you drive your vehicle there, just step out and we want to sample quickly. I want you sampling 500 to 1,000 acres in a day. Well, you can't do that if you're wandering around aimlessly or anything else. You have to have a plan. So you go to that point, you drive to that point with your pickup or your four-wheeler, get out and pull two cores on each side of the vehicle dump those all in the sample bag, the lab mixes the sample anymore, you don't have to do that, and then send that sample in. So it's real quick, but I want eight cores for each spot. The other couple things I would tell you is make sure you're going to the same depth every time, whatever depth you pick. Maybe you're doing zero to 12 inch, maybe you're doing zero to six inch, whatever it is, just make sure you have a mark on your probe, you're always going to the same depth, and keep that probe straight up and down every single time. It's really that simple for how you pull soil samples. When you get those samples in, now you've got to do a little evaluation there and try to figure that out, but if you use the Ag PhD Soils app, you can get Midwest Labs recommendations, you can get our recommendations, and certainly you you can ask us more questions too on the Ag PhD radio show. Every day we answer live phone calls. We do take a lot of soil test questions. So we'd love to see your soil tests if you have questions about what do I do with this ground now that I've got a complete soil analysis. Now let's say that you've been pulling samples for a while. The question is how often should you be pulling soil samples out in a field? Now if you've got a field where everything is pretty even out in the field and you've been monitoring it for a long time, hey, you can probably get away with pulling samples every few years. Maybe it's every third year or every fourth year, something like that even. If you've got big changes that are going on in the field though, and we certainly have that in some of our ground, we're pulling samples every single year. Now, if you're one of the highest yielding producers in the country and you say, I'm going for 400 bushel corn, I'm going for 500 bushel corn, well, chances are you're pulling them once a year or maybe even once during the growing season as well as in between crops. So there, there's different levels of intensiveness there. Uh, I would say for most farmers, they're looking at every third or fourth year. Regardless of where you have your soil tested, the big thing that we would tell you here is we want to see a complete analysis. You need to see a complete analysis. So what is a complete analysis? Well, here are some of the things we're looking for. The first thing we always talk about on a soil test is soil pH. Every crop has kind of its ideal range. Well, the ideal soil pH range for corn, soybeans, and wheat is about 6.3 to 6.8. So that's the first thing that we wanna look at on the soil test. If our pH is way out of whack, let's say it's eight, or let's say it's five, okay, we're giving up a lot of yield in corn, soybeans, and wheat. So the first money spent should be on adjusting that pH. We wanna get that pH down into that right range. Next, we're gonna take a look at how heavy is our soil? What's our cation exchange capacity? How much organic matter do we have? And then we're gonna continue on and talk about base saturation. When we look at that base saturation test, we're looking at a balance of certain nutrients out in the soil. The big ones I'm looking at here first are calcium and magnesium. We wanna have a certain ratio between calcium and magnesium in our soil. If we've got more calcium, we generally have more pore space in our soil. If we have more magnesium, that adds a stickiness to our soil to hold a little more water and, and to tighten up that soil. So we don't want it too tight, but then again, we don't want it too loose either. That's one of the things that base saturation will help you with. After that, we also want to make sure that we're looking at these secondary nutrients like sulfur, for example, Darren already mentioned calcium and magnesium, but then finally the micronutrients. You got to have a complete test to get the right answers and make the right decisions on your farm in terms of fertility. I guess one last thing I'll throw out, a lot of people ask us about soil health tests. Look, I can tell you if your soil is healthy or not just by looking at a regular soil test. Now for certain programs, you may have to pull a soil health test, 
but again, if you just go through all the things we talk about on a regular soil test and have complete data there, you're going to know if your soil is healthy or not. So on your farm, if you're asking yourself right now, ah, I don't know if it's super important for me to get great soil tests out there. Let me tell you, it is. Start with one field. If you don't have good soil test data from your farm, just pick one field. Look at it this year on a two and a half acre grid and see what's going on in that field. Once you understand how much variability there is out there and what you can change and how you can spend those fertilizer dollars a little differently to make more money on your farm, you'll see soil testing is really important. Last question, should I soil sample in the fall or spring? Sample as soon as you possibly can. I like it in the fall, then I have more time to analyze what I need to do prior to my next crop. Well, one thing you'll definitely have to do in your next crop is control our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? The weed of the week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, agriculture division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough, but we're tougher with unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the week is a tough winter annual grass. It's jointed goat grass. Well, this one can be a little bit difficult to identify. So what you want to do is dig the plant up. If you're finding a little spikelet attached to the root, then you're probably talking jointed goat grass instead of actual wheat. Yeah, you'll see some little hairs along the sides of the leaf as well, especially down towards uh, where that leaf blade hooks up to the stem. Uh, this is a tough weed, especially when it tillers out. It's really, really difficult to control in grass crops like wheat. Right, we so when you talk tillers, well, that's later in the season, so use a good pre-emerge herbicide to start. Yeah, you gotta get out there in the fall, there's no question. I like prepare as a pre-emerge herbicide. A lot of farmers are using Olympus. That's had some activity on it, as well as a pre-emerge if you're in a continuous cereals rotation. That's a good option for you as well. Post-emerge, there's really only a couple of things that have had any impact at all. You could use Osprey. Uh, that's been one that, that has worked. Uh, the other one has been beyond in Clearfield wheat. Now in the two gene, or where both parents are Clearfield, then you can use a strong rate of MSO. And what we've always seen with this chemistry, whether it's Beyond or Raptor in, uh, in other crops, if you can use MSO, it really improves the grass control that you're going to get out of it. Now the problem is if you've got a Clearfield variety that's, well, kind of tolerant, where it has just one parent that's Clearfield, then you can't really use the strong rate of MSO or you may see some crop response. All right, in corn and soybeans, we don't have a big problem with this because again, it's a winter annual grass. So if you do tillage in the spring, that's going to take care of it. Otherwise, in soybeans, not too tough. Just start with something like Trefland, Sonalan, or Prowl. Follow with Roundup, Liberty in those specific crops, or certainly Clethodem or one of the grass killers there. If you go to corn, I'd suggest Harness Surpass, Outlook, Dual, Zidual, one of the group 15s. Then follow post-emerge again with Roundup or Liberty in those crops, or Accent in conventional corn. The big thing is going to be crop rotation with jointed goat grass. If you're in continuous cereals, it's it's going to be a tough one for you to kill. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all around grain handling solution. Our conveyor based system uses an 18 inch belt and a 10 inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. And how about the big man, Pro Germinator? Yeah, this guy's got some experience in the field. But look at his stats. You can't argue with those kind of results. 
You're right. I know a lot of teams wishing their phosphorus player had those kind of numbers. Right, but this guy's not just phosphorus. He's got the nitrogen, the potassium, the micros. All those just add up to his phosphorus game. And his game is good. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. No two seasons are the same. Each brings its own set of challenges. And you've seen a few. So many threats, and not one single thing can be taken for granted. In the fight against the unpredictable, the Acceleron portfolio provides coverage on four fronts. Fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and bioenhancers. Rise stronger with one simple decision. Are you looking to make a career in an ag-related field? The Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation is pleased to offer a $2,500 scholarship for students enrolled in an agricultural program for the 2018-2019 school year. The goal with this scholarship is to further the education of students who understand the importance of proper stewardship and responsible nutrient management for agriculture and society as a whole. To learn more and apply, visit rnmf.org scholarship before October 15th. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. I got a question on the Ag PhD radio show from a farmer in Alabama who wanted to know the best way to apply a small amount of certain micronutrients. I'll explain in today's Iron Talk. While you don't need many pounds of micronutrients to feed good crops, the challenge is the level of micros often varies across the field and you're only applying small amounts of them. So how do you apply each one accurately? First, how you don't apply them is in a blend with your dry NPNK fertilizer in one big spreader. I like to tell this story about when I was first out of college and a farmer who had to apply some boron onto his alfalfa. Well, he had purchased dry fertilizer from a nearby fertilizer dealer and had them put it in a dry spreader along with his NPNK blend. That was about 10 miles away from his farm. So bouncing out to the field, the boron was not the same density as the NPNK blend, so the boron settled to the bottom of the spreader. As soon as he started that spreader up, all the boron for the whole field came out in the first 100 yards, effectively killing his alfalfa crop. Now he scraped up the top couple of inches of soil and then spread that out over the whole field, and the problem went away. The lesson's simple. To spread something like boron that only involves a few pounds for a whole field, it's much better to do it either in a liquid form or as a dry when it's all by itself. That way you can be certain that you got it just right. With variable rate, you can be very precise. Considering all the micros that you may need, you may have one fall where you make multiple trips across each field, getting each different micro spread separately. But since you remove so little of those micros each year with your crop, it may be the only time in the next 10 years that you need to do it this way. That's all for today's Iron Talk. And now, back to the show. That's our time for today, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show where we answer your live phone calls each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Sirius XM channel 147. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We've got another Weed of the Week, a Farm Basics Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.